Hello, my friends, my family, my dearest, my dearest uh, believers, yeah, our podcast listeners. We're glad to have you here today. We are. We're going to go ahead and get started, jumping right into it. Uh, today we have a little bit of mail from the mail bag. This is from Brother Josiah Chidi. He says, "Gentlemen, love the pod. Keep it up." Thank you, Brother Josiah. And by the way, <laughs> they have a podcast. Um, he and my brother have a podcast called O oh, Timothy. And uh, it's a great podcast. It'll be a help to you. And so he is asking this question. He's from uh, uh, out in Wisconsin. He said, uh, my question for you is this. Brother Antonios mentioned in passing the idea that there will be an economy in heaven with regard to buying and selling. Will that be what we use our rewards for that we receive at the judgment seat? And if that's not clear, could you give your thoughts on what purpose those rewards have for us in heaven? That comes from Brother Josiah Chidi. And, of course, you understand that a lot of what George says is rank heresy. So that's yeah, well, part. That's, that's, could be. <laughs> Just, if you would bear that in mind, if you will. <laughs> what, what do you have, Brother, Joe, uh, Brother George, for Joe? Well, it, uh, I think it was when we were discussing under Ezekiel, Lucifer, where the Lord tells him, this is Ezekiel 28, 5, by thy great wisdom and thy traffic mm, hast thou increased it, yeah. thy riches, and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. And however however you cut it, whether that's the actual prince of Tyrus, the human, or that is in the angelic realms now, or the Antichrist in the future, or Satan in a pre-Adamic civilization, the angelic world, there's, I mean, there's, you've got supernatural beings uh, in positions of authority dealing with traffic. Uh, the Bible tells us that the tabernacle is a pattern of things in heavens, in the heavens. <clears throat> and so the implication is that that's what you have out in the future. The Lord delivers talents to the servants. And he says, uh, and he tells them to basically trade with those, with those talents uh, and increase them. And so the, the very, the very idea of judgment is like, basically depending on it, the, it's an analogy of trading. And even the slothful and wicked servant, the Lord tells him, you should have given mine own to the exchangers that at my return, I should have, have had mine own with usury, with interest. <clears throat> so this is not as far-fetched as it sounds. Uh, and the angels are doing something. They're not sitting up there all day long, just worshiping. The cherubims, the Bible says that they worship day and night saying, holy, holy, holy. But if you read that just as it is, disconnected from any other, any other text, you might get the impression that that is exclusively what they do, but it's, it isn't because you see the cherubims coming down in Ezekiel chapter 10, chapter 1, chapter 11 in Jerusalem. They're moving back and forth. They go back up. Uh, they're talking to Ezekiel. They're giving him coals, you know. So They're providing transportation like Uber rides right. for God himself. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So day and night is not necessarily an, an, an incessant kind of activity uh, that's going on there. Um, so I think what's going on on earth is nothing but the human scaled, uh, replica or extension or illustration or pattern of what is really exists up in the heavens, because what, are, what is that gold and silver for? Uh, that's a good question. What are we doing with that? Um, I think you, you go on to rule the universe. Well, ruling the universe involves some structure, involves some growth. There's always the idea of growth. The idea of increase, the idea of purpose, the idea of activity, which is, we, we saw it not necessarily, not sinful. The, the toil that comes with the work and the curse that comes with the work is the consequence of the sin, but not the work itself. So I, looking for, I am looking forward to a world where, yeah, it could be that the gold and silver you get uh, is, and the precious stones is used for, for the economic purposes, just like it is here. Uh, the Lord says, if you have not been, been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who shall commit to you the true riches? And again, that parable too, he's talking about the the uh, unjust steward there, and he's commending him for his wisdom in dealing with financial matters. So, uh, I mean, this is kind of off the top of my head, but the way I live, I fully expect to once we enter, and we say heaven, let's let's call it the, the ages to come. So millennial and beyond, the millennial kingdom and beyond, wherever we may be geographically. But I fully expect that the angelic civilization and the and the human kind of a race and the angelic race, as we go on out in the future, there's trade going on, there's communication, there's the civilizations that are being built, languages and cultures. There's an entire kind of life with all its, its attendant activities 
that, is, that are going on, which are given to us here on earth to taste and to prepare for. Hmm. That's a good answer. Uh, I think that concept is basically an extrapolation or a continuation of what we know to be true and that the Lord says hmm. uh, in Revelation 5, has made us unto our God kings and priests, right? And this is referring to uh, there in, in Revelation chapter 5, the four and 20 elders. Mm, right. And they sing a song. Um, Thou was redeemest to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. This is going beyond just the Jews. And, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Mm -hmm. So when we think about that, what what George is saying is we're we're extending out that that truth. What would that look like if you were a king and a priest? Right. Right. And it's it's pretty obvious and in gaining by trading that type of thing, um, increasing the holdings or whatever. You know, it's not, not sitting around eating all day. Right. There's activity. They're, yeah. They're given uh, cities to rule. I mean, look, you're referencing uh, Revelation five. It's interesting here in verse 12 of chapter 5, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches mm. and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. What is the Lord doing with those riches? Uh, he's not just doing like Hezekiah, just storing them up and looking at them, which is fine. You can enjoy that. But the Lord, our God, is a God of activity. He's fully self-sufficient in his own, right? And mm -hmm. yet he still decides to create a universe that is filled with purpose, multifaceted purpose for different creatures. So... The idea is to go on and, and build and discover. Um, God knows what's coming. Actually, uh, this is maybe like a side note here, but the, if Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, we talk about eternity as if it's a monolithic block. Uh, but Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 suggests that it's not necessarily. So he's talking about, uh, this is Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, great. Then verse 2, 7, he says that in the ages to come, not just the age to come. So the age to come is the millennial kingdom. But in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So what, what, what that tells you is there are dispensations out in eternity. There are different ages that can be marked off. This was the age of this. This was the age of that. This was the age of this. This was not soteriologically speaking, but there's some kind of parameters to each age that distinguish it from a succeeding one. And that personally, I find incredibly exciting because that tells me that eternity is not a static state. That is, you're just in a perfect state of contemplation like the Easterners would teach and the Greek philosophers, but there are things changing. So there's continually new things to be built, new things to be discovered, new things to learn, new things to accomplish, new purposes without any sin, of course, without without the bane of sin. And that is so fun. That's so much fun. Because imagine if you always had the same kind of setting and you did nothing else. I don't care how great the video game is. I don't care how beautiful your mansion is. I don't care how great the setting is. We are built, built to desire increase. We are built to desire novelty. And th it seems like Ephesians 2, 7 suggests that that's going to be part of it. The ages to come. Hmm. Um, the only reference that I can find to pounds in the Bible is in Luke chapter 19, the parable of the pound, the pounds, and he delivers them 10 pounds. And he uses that, that term, of course, it's referring to money in verse yep. 15. He had given them money. And of course, the guys are gaining by trading. And I love how he says, have thou authority over 10 cities. Uh, so based on the pounds that someone gains, and we all are gaining pounds, but are we gaining the right kind of pounds? That's the question. Um, <laughs> but authority over cities. And then what happens at the end is the guy that, uh, you know, buries his, his pound or laid it up in a napkin, he ends up giving his pound to another person. So the guy that gained 10 pounds not only apparently gets the, the pounds, he gets the 10 pounds and he gets the 10 cities. You see that? Yeah. Because it says that's at the good. end, yeah, that's true. give it to him that hath 10 pounds. And so mm. it's, 
it's it's not like the Lord just says, okay, great, give me my money back. He's like, okay, that's yours, and I'm going to give you a city as well, 10 cities the based on every pound. That's good. That's uh, I, I didn't notice that. That's pretty wild stuff. Yeah, it so, is. And again, it's not like, I mean, I'm sure there's a whole lot more in Scripture that, that we're not finding, uh, which is always the case. But yeah, but there, it's not like it specific, explicitly states, you know, you're going to have a bank account, you're going to put money in there and have a have a debit card, you know, a heavenly debit card that you use to draw out. But the, it's just basically an understanding of how we exist now. And, you know, because even in our glorified body, we're eating food. Why are we eating yeah. food? Right. Right. You know? um, the, 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 even the the things that you are learning on Earth have a purpose out into eternity. They extend out there. So think of uh, Daniel. The last verse in Daniel, Gabriel the archangel, one of the archangels, tells him, but go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the mm. end of the days. And that seems to be in line with what he has been trained to do. He has a specific lot that, that Daniel's going to stand in at the end of the days to accomplish. And uh, in Revelation, twice the... Uh, and the Revelation is essentially Daniel chapter 2, really, part 2, right? They complete each other. And... Uh, twice John falls before the uh, the angel to worship him, and the, the angel tells him, "Where is that verse?" Uh, well, there's twice, but one of them is in chapter two, uh, verse eight. Chapter two, verse eight. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Now remember, children of the resurrection are as equal equal unto the angels, and Nebuchadnezzar had fallen before Daniel to worship him in chapter 2. Then saith he to me, unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant. Okay, you can say that of an angel, and of thy brethren and the prophets. That you can't say of an angel. And of where, them which keep these things. Revelation 22, 9. 22, I was looking at 2. Sorry, yeah, Revelation 22, 9. He says, I'm of thy brethren and the prophets. Now, if you pause there, that expression, the brethren, that cannot be angels. In fact, it's specifically stated that those are distinguished from human beings. Because when Paul is talking about Jesus Christ taking upon him the seed of Abraham, he specifically says uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, human brethren. Mm -hmm. The angels are have a different nature, are therefore are not our brethren. Add to that in Revelation chapter 22, verse 9, that he says, uh, keep the sayings of this book, worship him. And then verse 10, the angel tells John, and he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Well, that is the last commandment that Daniel had received from Gabriel in Gabriel chap mm -hmm. in Daniel chapter 12. Uh, seal up tells, the book. Yeah, tw exactly, 12, 9. Go thy way, Daniel, just like he tells him in verse 13. Go thy way, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And then he tells him, you're going to rest and you're going to send your lot to the end of days. And this guy shows up and he's unsealing a book, which is a continuation of Daniel. And when he receives worship, he says, I'm one of the prophets and one of your, I'm one of your brothers and I'm a prophet like you. So the indications are pretty strong. There's there's other pointers towards Daniel, but the indications are pretty strong that just like the angels that you see read about in the Gospels are Moses and Elijah, though never clearly stated, the indications are very strong. Likewise, the indication the angel that is ministering to John, the book of Revelation, is Daniel. But that, hmm. that means that Daniel is in fact continuing his prophetic ministry that he had here on earth, which means that the Lord had prepared him for what he would do out in the future. Now, um, you, re you referenced the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, yeah. let me look at that real quick because oh, I spelled it wrong. It's Moses and Elias in the New Testament, the yeah, the Greek uh, transliteration, I guess. That's right. Okay, so where is it that you are? You're getting that getting the light part, the the that that they are um, angels. Oh, the the like the two men who are sitting on either side of where the body of Jesus Christ was laid. Oh, oh, the, oh. Yeah. The the two men that are um that are present with the apostles at the ascension of Christ. I've never heard that before. 
with who they were there talking about with him about his decease, which he should accomplish in Luke eight, I think, and then the at the ascension and resurrection, uh, they're there also again, and they're saying, well, at one point they appear and they say, go to Galilee just like he had told you so. It doesn't say it's Moses and Elijah, but the indications are pretty strong that that this is Moses and Elijah. So likewise, it seems that uh, it's Daniel who's uh, ministering to John. Okay, now I want to I want to drill down on this and and uh, like, let's see here. I I, I just want to look at La Acts chapter one. Is there any other cross reference for Acts chapter one? With the two men, I don't think so. Not for the ascension. Mm -hmm. So the interesting there. Because they, we they, always they say it's the angels, but it does not say angel. No, in white apparel. And then when you read about them, their appearance at the Mount of Transfiguration says they appeared with him in glory. And you know they they were talking. And Luke tells us that they were discussing his decease when they appeared. And so this is him resurrected. And they're saying go to you know um, earlier they had appeared too. They had said go to Galilee. So. There are the okay. So Luke eight, where does he say deceased, which you should accomplish in Jerusalem? Uh, That's nine, nine, right? Luke nine thirty, and what nine? 31. Okay, sorry, nine. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Uh, well, the, well, the, the yeah. cross reference. It's not really cross reference to the ascension, but it says two men. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So here they're talking about his decease in Luke nine thirty one, and then at the tomb. Uh, Let's say on either side of the tomb. And one, one of the Gospels talks about two men on either side of the tomb. Does he say angels or men? Let me go check. See, that's what that I, that's where I'm getting confused because maybe it says angels there. I think it is uh, John twenty, verse twelve. Is that the one? What does it say? See, it's two angels in uh, in white sitting. Ah, that's it. Okay. John 20, verse 1? Uh, verse 12. Verse 12? Yep. Two angels in white sitting, yeah. the one at the head and the other at the, the other, feet yeah. where the body of Jesus where, in the head yeah, lane. Uh, exactly. So this is where he has been buried, and the Moses and Elijah had appeared to talk to him about his decease. Hmm. Hmm. So it's really tying in two men reference and in um, Luke 9. The two angels in white sitting at the tomb, and Acts chapter one, right, where it says, um, two, men, two men in again. white." Yeah, in white, exactly. Two men in white, two angels in white. Yeah, and okay. there the, the two are appearing in glory in Luke nine. <clears throat> I mean, you, you can't prove it beyond the shadow of a doubt, but it's like you know the arrows are, are pointing in the, in the direction of identifying these as Moses and Elijah. Two men stood by them in white apparel. Okay, so <laughs> so the whole point of it was basically that there is a direct correlation between what we do on the earth Correct. and what, what we do on and in heaven. And what we do on earth is not entirely divorced or completely foreign to what we would do in heaven. Right. And I, I was thinking, as you were mentioning Daniel and standing as a lot, I was thinking, you know, the Lord, the Lord is judging what we do on earth. And we're receiving gold, silver, and precious stones for the things that we have done on earth. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that there's a connection between here and there is is not far-fetched because why does it matter? Why right. does it matter? There's got to be some correlation between what we've done for God on this earth and what, yeah. what happens there. Yeah. And I mean, uh, Elijah runs... This is, this is a, a vaguer kind of connection, but... I mean, they came to it popped in mind once uh, I was reading the, the the book of Revelation. Elijah runs away from Jezebel. I mean, I'm not judging him for it, but he does he does kind of a, there's there's a tension between Elijah and Jezebel, right? And that's a picture of that whole period of time. There is a picture of the tribulation because he prays for three and a half years. It doesn't rain, etc. Well, when you get to the book of Revelation, all of a sudden you've got the two witnesses, one of whom is Elijah, and you've got Jezebel showing up in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Once more, so it's just bizarre that that you had Elijah as a Jezebel. That nexus there, um, in uh, well, it wasn't nexus; it was direct confrontation, First Kings nineteen, and then you get to Revelation. Now you have a nexus again with Elijah and, and Jezebel. So it's almost like 
Jezebel's got to fight that. Uh, Elijah's got to fight that uh, spirit that Jezebel again. You mm -hmm. know, part two. This is a yeah. vaguer one, but it's there. It's like what we're doing now. I'm not saying if you're stuck in a job that you don't like, that you're going to be stuck in a job, <laughs> in a ministry you don't like in eternity. That's not the <laughs> idea, you know. But whatever it is that 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 God has called you to do and that you do enjoy, you are being prepared to do something that is on a much grander scale in relation to that in which the Lord had trained you. That's why he says, if you're not, if you're unfaithful in the unrighteous mammon, who shall commit to you the, the true riches? And you, how many parables have to do with exactly that? The parable of the uh, the, the laborers in the vineyard. It's it's mm -hmm. it's a, it's an agreement between go work and I'll pay you, right? And based on a daily rate. So and what you're why... doing is going to bear fruit up there. And I think that uh, properly understanding the the different applications of scripture to the different groups of people. Uh, is so important because there is a truth in the prosperity gospel. Yeah. That that if you honor God, God will bless you. God will give you riches. God will give you great possessions. And people come by and they'll say, oh, no, 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 the Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't teach that. Well, it certainly does teach that, but not for this time frame. Right. It Because you think about who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So what... Christ left us an example that we should follow his steps. And what was that? To suffer and to die, but to be raised again. Never to die again. Never to suffer again. That's the ministry of Jesus Christ. So this life is more about living and dying, and then the resurrection, where Christ, his, his ministry was all of those things, and all together. And now, where is he seated at the right hand of the throne of God? Angels and principalities being made subject unto him. So that happened as a result of his suffering. So what's going to happen for us? Well, we should we should suffer. We should always bear about in the in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. But what we're saying, we're seated in the heavenly places. We know that he's going to change our vile body to be made like in his glorious body. From whence also we look for the Savior, right? We're mm -hmm. we're on this earth, suffering and and toiling, but we're already seated in heavenly places, and so. We're not going to be suffering and toiling to get there. There is a purpose and a reason for our suffering. Uh, you can't always trace it exactly. It's not always because of sin, but it's because we're mimicking, so to speak. We're echoing the life of Jesus Christ in our mm -hmm. own lives. And at some point, just like Jesus was exalted far above all principality and power, we're going to be exalted as well. Jo it's in the life of Joseph who is in the pit yep. in the prison, Potiphar's house. And then in one the word of Lord tried him. And yes, yeah. calls him right. up the rapture into the throne room, so to yeah. speak, and uh, and boom, now he's off and running. Second yeah. in command. That the the those what we're talking about now, the realization that not necessarily there's a direct connection between what I do now and what I'm going to do in heaven, but that what I'm doing now, whatever it is, has an effect. Um, it kickstarted my study, and when I was in university, nothing could get me to study. Nothing. I was. I was kind of just completely unmotivated, uh, threat or promise, never, nothing worked. And then my mother actually told me, she's like, what do you think Jesus Christ is going to judge you on? You know, if, if the rapture happens today, what, yeah, it's like, you know, cause I was waiting to do the spiritual stuff and, you know, studying wasn't the spiritual stuff. She's like, hmm. that is, you got a reward for that. He expects you to be studying. And he's going to reward you for the studying. You are studying unto the Lord. That is part of what you're supposed to do. That is what God has called you to, to do at this point in your life. And man, when I when I when I heard that, I'm like, wow, that's like, wait a second, like, I can study not only to get good grades and a good life on earth, but that's going to affect the kind of rewards I'm going to get up. I'm going to get. Well, then let's go. You know, and I was on a do. I went from the 40s and failing classes to being on the dean's list because of that. Hmm. Wow. Well, you know, that that's the, the command in Second Timothy. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Approved unto God, not approved unto the audience, approved unto my, my you know, ministry bros. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. ashamed. And that shame is connected with the second coming of Christ or the, the, the rapture and the judgment seat, that we may not be ashamed before him at his coming. Yeah, that judgment seat. Yeah, that's serious stuff. I got a, a brother in in the church, dear friend of mine, Dominique Mathieu. He's he loves the Word of God, Frenchman that got saved years ago, and he's asked the Lord repeatedly, 
you know, this is very dear to his heart. He says, Lord, whatever my responsibility is that you're going to give me out in eternity, I want it to be connected with your word. Mm. You know, and you see the division. It. Yeah, it's great. And, and I'm like, man, that's a great idea. I'm going to ask the Lord for, for that too, you know. Me too, Lord. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be in that department, Lord. <laughs> you know? Yes. So, and you see that division of labor amongst the angels. So, uh, there are little there are little phrases like this, but man, they they they're pregnant with meaning. So, like in uh, actually, it was my recent readings recently, Revelation uh, sixteen, Revelation sixteen. Where's the? There's a power. There's an angel that had power over fire. I think we mentioned that he wants to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, think, Fourteen. Yeah, I was going to say I don't think it's sixteen, but yeah. Revelation 14, 18. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire. Okay, so that, that guy, he's like, you know, the X-Men guy. He's, his, his, his power that the Lord's given him is over fire. Satan seems to have his own. He's the prince of the power of the air. So it seems like when he fell, he was particularly... If, do you remember, you ever watched um, Captain Planet? Or was that uh, after your time? It was a little after, yeah. I know what you're yeah. talking about, though. Yeah. So those young men, they have rings that call on the natural elements. With the, with the particular rings, they control specific natural elements of water, fire, earth, wind. And so um, it seems like it, that's what the heathen got that. There's a truth to that because even in Revelation chapter 16, you've got a particular angel, uh, verse 4, and the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou righteous, O Lord. Now, I don't think that's random. I can't prove it, but it doesn't sound like the Lord randomly picked some angel to do that. It's the Lord is, is particular and purposeful and intentional about the things that he does, especially whom he ordains to do what. So it seems like there's an angel that has power over rivers. There's an angel that has power over fire. There's an angel that, that has power over air. And so that would explain where those heathen got those concepts of the God of fire and the God of water. Poseidon is the God of water. Hephaestus is the god of the underworld, you know, Zeus is the god of the ether. They're not, they were not as stupid and ignorant and and superstitious. I mean, they were, but not as much as we think they were. There was a grain of truth that they knew uh, from the fallen gods. So when I see division of labor over there, and, and I see it with the, uh, the some some of the angels are warriors, some of them are scribes. You read about in the Bible. And you see that, you're like, wow, so this is really, it's a civilization. I mean, there is, there, there's, there's, there's structure and communication and trade and, and coming and going. It's not just people sitting on a cloud playing the harp all day long. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about how we always think, yeah, anything out there, that's, that's silly. They're trying to ex describe things here that they don't understand. Um, but the truth of the matter is they were trying to describe things from the other world that they did not understand. And right. those things are the ones that are brought in. Well, in fact, that's, that's what Jesus does when he comes back. He brings the kingdom with him. Whose kingdom? His kingdom. And the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. He, but he, we're praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And so how things are done in heaven is the way he's going to run the earth in the millennium. And it, it's obvious that rewards are a part of that society and that culture rewards oh. and, and retribution for the mm -hmm. wicked. So it's exciting stuff. Yeah, it is. It really is. It, it, it does something for your Christian life, man. That it boosted my Christian life. That really, this is the stuff that keeps me going. I really mean it. That's the stuff that keeps me going. Like, when, you, when I read my Bible and I, I get so excited for the world to come, it makes the setbacks here on earth and the disappointments uh, much easier to swallow. Because I've, you, you know, set your affection. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Seek those things. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, you got to know about those things to set your affection on them. They cannot be flu and amorphous and vague and, and kind of just, you know, out there in the ether. I cannot set my affection personally on something that is like, oh, I'm going to be in a beautiful mental state. Well, you will start talking to me about horses of fire, chariots of fire, 
gold and silver and precious stones and streets of gold and trading and learning languages and traveling and discovering cultures and ruling. And now you got my attention personally. Mm -hmm. you know? Yep. Yep. And if that stuff, if that stuff is real, why aren't we talking about it? And if it's real, why are we acting like this is all there is? And this is what's most important, especially George. Here's the thing that always cracks me up, especially knowing that we're going to die. So you got people mm. that are complaining about how, you know, the world's getting bad. Things are going down. My health is failing. I'm not feeling you know, Okay. What does that mean? You have an expiration date. You're no different than a, a little can That's of your, right. a little uh, a container of yogurt. You, you yeah. are going to go bad at some point. That's good. That's, okay. So that's... if you, if you know that, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Yeah. And what's some of those one... things, some of those, those things on the shelf have a longer expiration date than you and me. They really yeah, do. The, the, the MRAs. I think like Twinkies would still be here after a nuclear Holocaust, you know? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So maybe we should start calling people Twinkies, you know? <laughs> You're not even strong as a Twinkie. Oh, so, so, so I'm thinking, okay, Look at, like he said in Titus chapter 2, uh, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope mm. and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity in this present world and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. So you see how he ties in... Uh, a, the desire, the ability to live in a mm. wicked world by looking forward to the next world, right? To the to the appearing of Jesus Christ. Yes, yes, and I need to know that this is physical and literal, and that what I'm experiencing here is a picture of what's to come. It, we're constantly, as Bible believing literalists, we're constantly derided that we're like, oh, we're dumb, you know, we're dumbing down the, the biblical revelation, and it's all symbolic, and it's all. I mean, come on, man. Okay, the guy who's telling me that, though, you know what he's busting his back to do he's busting his back to buy an actual house mm -hmm. not a mental state an actual house he's busting his back to buy a nice car an actual car he looks forward to going back or she looks forward to going back to an actual person physical that they can hug and kiss and love and children that they can hug and kiss and love and play with i mean you're you're, you're busting you're making fun of me for looking forward to literal things uh i'm talking about the people who deny the literality of the bible here and then they but but then they turn around and they they are trying to build a bank account which is of actual physical money and they want to take an actual physical vacation on an yeah. actual physical island. So even though it's not physical money, but yes, right, I right, understand. exactly, all this, yeah, <laughs> less and less so, right. But they're going to get something tangible with it eventually. So every we we are I'm going to something tangible. I am excited. I can't wait. That we are. I tell the church, you are the kings in training by the Lord is training the people who are going to take over the universe and run the economy of the universe, run the kingdom. There's something to run. I mean, you have to order all this. Mm -hmm. all, all those people, all those people, especially if we believe that there are human beings who go on procreating for others, uh, forever and possibly even the angels. Like, what do you do? <laughs> you don't just let it go. You got to give them something to do. Well, and that's the thing. It's it, like, well, there won't be any sense. There won't be any. There won't be any need to do anything. Yeah, but go back to Genesis, sure, chapter one and two. There was no sin, and God gave Adam a very clear job description, and He gave him a helpmeet, and He commanded him to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Uh, why? Not because He was trying to overcome sin, because there was no sin. And so it, it, it's like right. that's a reset revelation. You know, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It's a reset of what God had originally started. And, you know, I hear people sometimes, and it sounds crazy. We're going we're gonna to repopulate other planets, or we're going to populate other planets? What kind of nonsense is that? I'm like, I don't know. It doesn't seem like nonsense when you got Elon Musk, whose yeah. job is to create a multiplanetary civilization. Right. Right. <laughs> it's not as far-fetched as, it's just, no. no, because we haven't thought of it, it sounds wild. It's like yes. it used to be wild to, to, to travel transatlantically. It used mm -hmm. to be crazy. Like, who's doing that? You know, there's there'd be dragons out there. Well, <laughs> right. you know, I have a little something to tell you. There's dragons out in, out, out in outer space, too. Oh, my soul. That's good. It, that's a side note. But, uh, yeah, it's it's crazy when, when you get that. Because while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. 
for the things which are seen are temporal, right. but the things which Trans are not seen, seen are eternal. eternal. Absolutely. Looking at the things that are not seen, how can you? Well, that's how Moses did it. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. Yeah. Look at how the Lord set up. Uh, we mentioned that in Genesis 2 when we got it. He, he talks about the onyx stone and gold, which is kind of, you know, bizarre. Out of these, They seem out of place mentions. Like, if you're thinking of the Bible as a religious book, but then he's 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 listing the natural resources that are in the land. And then he tells you Ethiopia, Havila, Eden, Assyria. I mean, those are neighboring countries and natural resources. And look at how God has allocated those natural resources and differentiated them amongst the continents of the world. And then according to, to, to uh, Paul referencing Moses in Genesis 11, he has set the bounds of the habitations of all people. And so the Lord divides the nations and the tribes. And I mean, look, you go to the Arabs, they don't have water, but they have the oil, right? Uh, Lebanon has the oil, has the water, but not the oil. And at one point, uh, one of the presidents of Lebanon suggested that we trade water for oil. He was laughed at back then. Now everybody thinks he's a genius. Um, you go to some countries, you know, South Africa has got the gold. Uh, Canada's got the uranium. And some countries have the rare earth materials. Some countries have got the agriculture and the fertile soil. So they, they, some countries have the wheat and the rice. How come we don't all have rice? And how come we don't all have wheat? And how come we don't all have oil? And how come we don't all have water? And what the Lord basically has done is he's forced mankind to trade. What does trade do? It actually builds trust. It it builds prosperity. And it, it's the, the ties of trade help peace, help help keep peace together. It brings civil, uh, cultures into connection where there can be cross dissemination of cultures and foods and discovery. Uh, it's it's marvelous. I mean, so when I see that on the planet Earth, and I'm told that these things are patterns of the heavens, then something like that must exist in the heavenly places themselves. Especially when you read Romans, uh, the book of Hebrews, it goes on and on about a little tent on the Earth is a picture of what's in heaven. Mm -hmm. So, okay, there's a temple in heaven. Well, where does that temple exist? It's in a it's in a it occupies space with delineations in that space so mm -hmm. there's an there's a there's a court because there's a court to that right there's a priesthood down here so there, there's people up there angels who are functioning as priests not everybody can just walk into the temple anytime down here so not everybody can just walk into the temple up there and you read about the angels with the seven vials coming out of the temple to pour the vials and the cherubim is handing a vial to one of the angels everything is you know structured and it talks about the Bible talks about angels' food. Man that eat angels' food. And it talks about the, uh, animals up there, chariots of horses, horses of fire. Where are the stables? Who takes care of the horses? Those are they don't just. It's not just poetry. This, these are actual realities that exist with people who are in charge of them, who run them, who manage them. They don't have all the resources, and they gotta interact with other people who have the administrative resources or natural resources, and that creates a bond between everybody. And it creates a peace between everybody and it's enriching to everybody. And there is productive activity, meaningful activity that the Lord looks back and enjoys. And we, we can too. So I am, man, it's like I can bust out of my clothes. Like, let's go. I, I can't wait to, to, to plug into that, man. I can't wait. You got, you got me thinking about this. Um, is there a reference in scripture to heaven being a city? No. No. The, New Jerusalem is a city coming that comes down from god descending from heaven from god having the glory of god that's how it's described that's mm -hmm. why i say that the heavenly jerusalem is just the capital of the universe but it's not heaven um he yeah was it Re revelation 21 he carried me away in the spirit mm -hmm. to a great high mountain showed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from god right like, and same thing in 21 too now this is this is going to rain on the Southern Gospel Parade, or the you know the old school gospel songs, because there is a type in a, it, there is a certain way in which heaven is a city where people dwell, so forth. But it kind of ruins the whole idea to say that heaven is a city, like it's a floating city up there. What if heaven? And this is the way Scripture indicates: heaven is a land. It is it is a country. Yeah, it's a completely different civilization that contains a city. Correct. And that particular city is the city that Abraham was looking for. Correct. Right? And right. Hebrews, what is it? He, yeah, um, Hebrews 11. 
And he said, so he looked for a city whose builder and with child foundations whose builder and maker is God. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so now they desire, oh, oh, that's good. A better country, a better country that is in heavenly for wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them, for them a, city. a city. Yeah. So they, they, you're desiring heaven, but you've got a city in that country. And, uh, since Jerusalem is the, uh, I mean, Jerusalem is literally said to uh, be in the midst of the nations in Ezekiel 5, 5. God says he has set Jerusalem in the midst of the nations. Heavenly Jerusalem comes down and it seems to hang in the midst between earth and heaven. And it, it, it acts like a medium between the two. So his Jerusalem is the capital of a land which typifies heaven. Then the implication is that Jerusalem is one of many cities, but it is the crown jewel really of God's kingdom. So hmm. heaven would be a land with multiple cities, but the new Jerusalem is the one that connects heaven and earth together, the heavenly Jerusalem. So I'm looking forward to, man, I, I can't tell you, man. That's that's the thing I'm looking forward to the most, really. I, you know, I, oh, man, I can't wait. You get up there and you find out all those cherubims and the seraphims and God knows what kind of angels, because angels is an umbrella term in the Bible that God has created and they're free moral intelligent agents and they've built things and they created things. Paul talks about the tongues of angels, which implies that angels have also their divisions and their tongues. Ezekiel, uh, uh, Aaron's got 12 stones and they represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Then Lucifer in Ezekiel 28 has got nine stones, which implies that they represent nine tribes of angels. And you can pretty much come up with that from scriptures more or less. So that would mean that there's, Imagine if you get up there and there's like nine different tribes of angels and each of their language, each of their culture, each of their section of heaven that they occupy and we're, or their sector, then they rule over a sector of the universe and we're traveling back and forth between those planets and acting as diplomats, acting as representative of God, where the children, where the royalty, we are traveling from planet to planet, just like the royal family of the Commonwealth of the United Kingdom travels to Canada, they travel to Australia, you know, they're received there, they overlook this charity, they overlook that. That is what we are fixing to get into. And that is what the Lord is preparing us for. But the responsibility is so awesome that the last guy who had charge of that ruined everything for a whole bunch of people. And so the Lord now is going to prepare us through the veil of planet Earth before he exalts us to redeem the heavens and run the universe through us. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about this here as you're talking about that. This, the word city is coming to mind. Um, it says Hebrews 13, 14, for here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Just... And so we, we are looking for a city like like uh, Abraham was. But then Hebrews 12, 22, he said, but ye are come unto Mount Sion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. And over and over again, in Revelation, it says that this city is coming down from God out mm -hmm. of heaven. Yes. It, from God. So what is, is God living in an empty room or empty space? Just no, nothing else there. No, he's, he's like the country of heaven and there's all kinds of angels up there. But that particular, what we, where we end up, uh, the body of Christ, it seems, is in that city that is in between uh, heaven and earth. That connects mm -hmm. the heavens and the earth. So we are kind of the go-between, it seems. I've heard people theorize that, and it seems to make sense to me, that there are two thrones. There's one where Jesus Christ sits, and there's one that David sits, where David sits, um, in the earth, in the earthly Jerusalem, and that would be David's throne, yeah. and the heavenly Jerusalem where Christ sits. That's, that, that's very possible. Uh, resurrected David in the millennial context, is alternatively described by the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel as either prince or king. And of course, the Jews can't make heads or tails of, with that, but we can, because we know that, yes, he's the king, but really, right, mm -hmm. he is under Jesus Christ, who is the king of kings and lord of lords. And yeah, that makes perfect sense. That, and that would um, fit exactly with Joseph. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Only in the right. throne will I be greater than thou. That's right, yeah. So you've got Jesus Christ, in the heavenly Jerusalem, suspended over the earthly Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
and, and, it's, and I mean, it, it makes sense that we would be like that. We'd be the in between. We are. We would. We're gonna be the only people with twin natures in a sense, like Jesus. Right? He's like he's heavenly and earthly. Right? It's it's an fantastic place to be, man. I love it. Like, so we are that. We are both heavenly and earthly, which is where you know, like that our, our hyper dispensationalist brethren, I think, get it wrong. They see the heavenly part. They're like, oh, it's not earthly. It's not earthly. So they're right, but we are earthly. I mean. We, we are of the earth we're redeemed from the earth we've got a twin nature i am i am a man but i am he was joined unto the lord as one spirit right uh so jesus christ prayed that we and the father may be one as he and the father are one and so right. we would be like that transformer which is 220 and 110 on either side we can go seamlessly back and forth with those new resurrection bodies between interacting with the earthly realms and the planetary realms and interacting with the heavenly realms. That's exactly what, what the Lord said in Philippians. He said, "Who shall change our vile bodies that it, it may be our vile body that may be fashioned like unto His glorious body?" Uh, his glorious body was able to appear mm -hmm. as a man. It was able to eat. Yep. It was able to talk and and to be heard, and it was also able to walk through closed doors and it was change also its able form. To which think of all the pranks we could oh, play. Yeah, where's that? Where's that? Where's that verse? You're it appeared in another form. Uh, yeah, know, is it Luke. Uh, Mark sixteen twelve. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. Huh? How cool is and, that? In another yeah. form. There's a mystique <laughs> there from X Men. Yes. Huh? Yes. How well, cool? Not, Can, I don't think know of all the pranks. <laughs> eh? Yes. Well, Luke twenty four, right? That's the same thing. Isn't that referring to? I think it uh, says their eyes were holding there. Uh, their eyes. Uh... Yeah, but then, but then he was revealed to them. Yes. Um, Luke twenty four, where they're walking, and he appears yeah, to verse them, 16. and they do not recognize him. Yeah. So in verse so, sixteen, it says their eyes were holding, but Mark says he appeared on another form. Yeah. Well, why? Because they they couldn't see spiritually. His, his spiritual form, yeah. you know what I mean? His spiritual body. They could only see his physical body. That would make sense. But that whole idea, because then after they, it says, he sat at me with them, he took bread, blessed it, break, and gave to them, and their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Yeah, but it seems like they didn't even recognize him physically. Because it could right. be that good, it could be that their eyes were holding through the functionality of him appearing in another form. That's what I'm so saying. Luke so Luke is you're, giving you the effect, but mark the method. Right, you're putting them both together. Right. And that... Yeah, exactly. Luke is, is saying this is how it affected them. That makes right. sense. But right. man, you're right. Being able to, to change form. And here's here's another thought. Why not the duality of nature, so to speak? Because Jesus Christ became a man. Right. That was he, he took upon him the form of a servant. It's made mm -hmm. in the likeness of men. Right. And and you and I, in a sense, uh, as believers right now in the body of Christ, also have a dual nature. Sure. The old nature and the new. Well, Peter says partakers of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. He literally says that partakers of the divine nature. So Christ partakes of the human nature. So part, you know, yeah. So God, the Lord partakes of man's nature, so man can partake of the Lord's nature, and we become twin natured, Gemini. You know, connecting both worlds, spiritual and physical. How we got the package deal of all times, man. I mean. We got it all in Jesus Christ. We have right. got and it all. That's the key in Jesus Christ. In yep, Jesus of Christ. Course. Because that's the nature that we have, the new nature of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so it's interesting because in the Old Testament, people did not have the new nature of Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, they right. weren't born no, again. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. They're they not didn't. born again. And so, how you know, that's why... Uh, the Lord said, except you be born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is a completely new spiritual nature that is not just, It's that's why the difference in the Old Testament, um, God had certain guidelines and rules for people to follow. And yes, it was always the blood sacrifice that was a substitute uh, for yeah. their sin, always. And yet, what if they didn't offer the sacrifices? They they It was not okay with God. It was not okay. And no. there's only one that we know of who who was the exception, and that was David. He had the sure mercies of David who committed adultery and murder, for which there are no sacrifices. Correct. And God forgave him. 
And that's the type of, of you and I in the, in the new believer, but that it was not the sure mercies of every Israelite. No, individually. It's funny. I, I just got to, my brother-in-law who's a pastor was just talking to me about this this morning. Yeah. Sure. We've got the sure mercies of David. Thank God. No, it's exciting stuff. So I don't know. Yeah. Traffic. So uh, I'm sure there's some verse I'll rem we'll remember after we finish the conversation, but um, it's 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 a little speculative, I'll grant you, but it's fun speculation. It gets me going and it helps my spiritual life. And there's sure a lot of verses that that seems to echo it. So, yeah, I, I love it. Um, just one more tie-in: if if uh, if Joseph is like a, a type of Jesus Christ, which of course he is in many ways, but if Joseph is also a type of David. And being the second in command, the second ruler in the land, and Jesus Christ would be uh, an example of the ultimate ruler over the whole earth. Mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking about how he says, he says, um, I guess this was, this was, uh, hold on, let me look at this. Okay, this is, this is a little bit of a stretch, so hang in there. No, we, um, we've been stretching all, all, all <laughs> podcasts long, so don't let it stop you now. <laughs> <laughs> so this this is actually referring to uh, to Joseph when the brethren go back and talk to their father about how yeah we saw uh, we got some we wanted to get some corn but the Lord of the country was rough with us and so forth and he told us this forty two thirty four bring your youngest brother unto me then shall I know that you are no spies but that you are true men so will I deliver you your brother and you shall traffic in the land I was just you, that word uh, traffic yeah kind of ties in a little bit uh the idea of doing business and uh, that's the reason why by the way they multiplied in the land that's the reason why pharaoh came out against him the pharaoh that knew not joseph right because they had multiplied they had done business and done so well that they were a threat to the civilization absolutely i mean okay so, well, i mean if not what else do we have to look forward to i, I know like the, you know the spiritual answer i love when i'm in church you know, when there's a great service, especially the singing, man, when the singing is on, you know, there's some times where there's some days where the singing is just on and uh, the people is just are just singing and it's great. There's so much joy. Place is packed. I love that. <clears throat> I love it. Uh, but and, and I, I can't imagine how beautiful heaven is. And I get up there and I'm singing. That's great. But, you know, the, the Lord himself likes diversity. We can see that in creation. Everything in creation is, is a celebration of diversity and cell of life. He does 60,000 different kinds of plants. And we're talking about what has survived, that was what hasn't gone extinct. I don't know how many different types of flowers. I don't know how many types of different types of spices. I don't know how many different colors. I mean, you, you see that all that kind of variety. I got up. If, if you're going to get excited as a Christian for heaven, especially when Satan has presented a boring view of heaven, especially to young people. These young people, you know, it's like, you know, I'm going to party in hell, whatever. Heaven is boring. It's it's just a suit and tie, and we're not doing anything, just sitting on a cloud, doing nothing. But, hey, I'm not in hell. I'm not in the fire. I can. That, I think the devil has portrayed it as boring. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we ought to study the scriptures and show the people of God. Like, I mean, There's all kinds of information, tidbits for us. If you dig into that mine... There's all kinds of jewels that are revealed to you telling you about the glories that are coming. And that's what I could not stay motivated. If, if the only thing I had in my mind is oh, I'm going to be up there with Jesus. I know it doesn't sound spiritual. I love the Lord Jesus Christ, but I know I'm going to be up there with Jesus because I'm saved. I'm not going to be up there with Jesus because of the things I've done. I'm going to be up there with Jesus because I trusted his righteousness. But what gets me to, to serve the Lord? Well, your love for the Lord. Absolutely. But let's face it, sometimes my love for the Lord Jesus Christ wanes. It's not where it should be. And it helps to know, even as a son with a father, you can love your father to bits, right? It does help when your dad goes, um, listen, son, if you if you study hard and you do right and you don't cheat, you you know, whatever, you 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 pass this exam, I'm gonna get you something nice. Okay, well, great. Like, what do you mean something nice? Well, I'm not gonna tell you, it's gonna be something nice. You'll have to trust me. Now, granted, you'll have to trust him, and and you ought to go and do it and trust your dad and work. Uh, but man, it, sh would, it sure would help if the Lord go if your father goes. Actually, uh, we're talking about a car, hmm. a really cool car, without necessarily exactly telling you what it is. Come on, 
you would be that much more motivated. Mm -hmm. You're doing it because you want to, because it's good for you to study and to or to work. You're doing it because you love your dad. And you want to make him proud. Granted, but you got to admit that once he tells you there's a surprise, it kicks it up a notch. And then when he gives you a hint about what it could be, and it's something you've been dreaming about, all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> it just David, David twice, twice. He hears about uh, Samuel, Saul saying, if you kill Goliath, you're going to be a free man and the king will give you his daughter. Like, you go from a poor shepherd to a prince and king's son-in-law. And he asks the first time and he gets blasted by his older brother who treats him as, you know, oh, like, uh, get out of here. Are you serving just for the reward type of question, you know? And David's like, whatever. And he turns around, the Bible says, and he asks a second time. He's like, remind me what the reward was? It's like, yeah, yeah, you become a free man and the, and the king's uh, son-in-law. is like, oh, I'm doing this. you know, God is with me. What are you guys waiting for? I'm going for it. And he goes for it. And he's David. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think if we were to just say, um, what did the Lord do in his glorified body? Did he sit in the temple and wait for them to come? No, he was he was interacting with them. Amen. He, he was uh, he, he, he walked along with them. He hid himself in another form and walked along with them. Um, he made, he made food for them and they sat around a campfire Good. and ate fish on the, on the coals. And then he, he dialogued with them and said, here, here's what's going to happen. Uh, and, and what, what I find amazing too, is that he's giving them instruction still. He's saying, Hey, you know, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. And, so you got you got the Lord interacting, caring. He's not like you're not you're too holy to be around me. He's right there with him. He's able to go back and forth. And uh, I'm sure if you dug into just the post resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ, you're going to find all kinds of things that the Lord does as a as a picture of what's coming. Yeah, I like that. He didn't just he did something with his new body, and it, probably. For the very one of the, he has many reasons in mind when he does something, he's multi intentional. One of them is exactly this what we're doing now is to give us an idea of what we will be able to do uh, to encourage us. You know, the, the book of Hebrews talks about those that have tasted the powers of the world to come, mm, mm. the powers of the world to come. You've tasted them, so that you know, the ability to, <clears throat> to do all kinds of supernatural stuff because you're partaking in the divine nature and you are in a sinless body now, and now you are spiritually mature enough. Right, to handle those responsibilities and it's basically god goes you you know you've you're you're adopted now you know you have you have matured go ahead you think about this george think about in the new jerusalem it says uh the the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it and we think saved not in the, sa the sense of saved like we are saved but rescued rescued from what from the tribulation rescued from the destruction, the total death of everyone on the planet. They were saved from that. And it says, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. There What's you it going to be like? Beautiful. It's going to be like watching these troops, this, you know, hey, Ethiopia's here. Oh, and, my you know, goodness. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's so good. <laughs> and they come in, up, they come in with their music and their dancing and their yeah. drums and their banners. Oh, wait, excuse and their, me. And their food. Me? What was hey? this? The drums? Yeah, yeah. The tabrets, <laughs> tabrets. Tabrets. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I got on the flesh yes. there for a second. I, yes, yes. I should have picked um, Canada or something, you know, the North. We're going to bring Canada. in the poutine. You know what a poutine is? <laughs> oh, I love poutine. Yes, sir. It's, that what, is good. What, I'm not sure what is exactly. It's like we, we got the French fries from the Belgians and we got the gravy from the Americans. I guess it's the cheese. I don't know. <laughs> What makes it it's Canadian? The, it's but... the uh, combination of those things. That's what <laughs> That's it is. It. But, you know, and then, and then, whoops, sorry about that. Um, if you go to chapter 22 in Revelation, you see where it has this pure river of water of life. And it bare 12 manner of fruits. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So they're coming back. And there's something about this tree that can help this nation. And I think this is what um, Walt Disney was trying to do to create uh, in his parks. So you've got in animal kingdom, you've got the tree of life and that's supposed to represent, you know, all of the animal kingdom. And then you've got Epcot, which is literally all the cities 
round about this great big body of water and they have this huge fire uh, i'm sorry um uh laser light show and they have these parades constantly that circle and it's like representing all the different cultures of the world and i think that's just a weak picture of what is coming in the new jerusalem uh god putting everyone together and I, that's what you see and then not only that you don't go to you don't go to epcot or to walt disney world for education you go there for fun but what if that was like a hospital and you're going there because your your country needs something and it it gets to go up to the tree and the tree has different kinds of fruit on it and uh you have to have that specifically it's like who's taking care of the tree who's handing out the fruit you know all that kind of <clears throat> all that kind of stuff comes into play when you start thinking about you know ma massive delegations from all over the world how good is that mm. i love it's a blessing it. So when all the, the nations, the nations of the earth shall flow unto it, the prophets say. Mm, yes. Feast of Tabernacles, all those. You ever, you know, ever seen the the Olympics game ceremony, opening ceremony? Mm. You know. Yep. <clears throat> times ten thousand, and mm. all those people are flowing to Jerusalem, and mm. to to worship the Lord Jesus Christ and the music and. Oh, my yeah. Here, here's a thought. Uh, uh, you Lord. ever been on a plane to Vegas? No. The people on a plane to Vegas are ready to, I mean, they're ordering drinks. They are lubed up, man. They're like, <laughs> they're liquored up and they, they're just, they're just so like, they're loving life. Like I'm getting out now coming back from Vegas. That's a different story altogether. But I just think about everybody. What's spent uh, in know, Vegas stays in Vegas too. They should say <laughs> it's true, but it's like going to the youth camp on a bus. You know, there's this excitement cool. and where are we going? And I could just see people boarding a plane for the new Jerusalem and uh, the joy and fun that it will be there. Um, Cause how are they getting there? Like they're not flying in the, in the, through the air themselves. They're humans. And so there's gotta be either airfare or some light speed rail across the Atlantic. You know, I don't know. Um, maybe it's going to be Epcot, baby. It's going <laughs> to be just like that the monorail, the master's monorail. They shall be, I think there's a verse, uh, there's a verse in the, in the, in the prophets that hints that we might be in charge of that to some degree, that transportation. And, and that's, by the way, that's, you know, when the Lord Jesus Christ tells Nathaniel, uh, henceforth, uh, thou shalt see the angels ascending and descending upon the son of man. Hmm. If you've got that picture, that glory is above the earth. The Psalms often say, and you remember that, that like in the Psalms, one of the, mm -hmm. One of the expressions that is repeated constantly is that your glory is the glory of God is above the earth. And mm -hmm. we read that the heavenly Jerusalem has got the glory of God and descends. That's another indication that it's floating over the earth. And so it's ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So Jesus Christ is an earthly Jerusalem and then heavenly Jerusalem alternatively. And we too, uh, as our responsibilities may require of us. So our headquarters, our HQ is that heavenly city, but we are coming down and back up and down. By the way, was, when you mentioned Vegas, I got to tell you this. A few years ago, I was in the, an airplane and uh, the lady sits next to me and she puts in the sleeve of the seat in front of her a book about Jesus Christ. So I'm like, oh, uh, you know, there's maybe an opportunity to witness or maybe she's, she's saved. So I point to the book. I'm like, oh, it's a book about uh, Jesus Christ. She's like, oh, yeah. He's, I'm like, oh, I'm a, you know, are you born again Christian? I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm safe. She's like, oh yeah, I'm a pastor. She tells me. I'm like, really? She says, I'm like, well, that that figures. You know, you've got the, fe <laughs> <laughs> the female pastors in Las Vegas. <laughs> we got a drive-through wedding chapel. <laughs> We're cranking them out, baby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, how about you? Just mentioned the la the uh, ascending and descending. Remember the that phrase in Jacob's dream. Mm -hmm. The ladder set up on the earth, the top That's of right. it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending upon it. Yep, the picture of that. Um, by the way, since we're at the tree of life, that's a perfect tie-in to, uh, I wanted to talk about that. What do you think the tree, uh, do you, how, you know, I've got some verses on there, and I got this, Ruckman kind of put, put me on the scent of that, and I did some studies on that, about the tree of life being, uh, uh, no, the tree of knowledge of good and evil being a vine tree. What do you, what mm. do you, you got anything on that? Well, I think, here's what I think, George, we're at an hour and five minutes. I think we should probably tie this into the next episode 
and hit it hard because we Josiah Chidi basically ruined this podcast <laughs> or this episode at least. Like we were going somewhere and then we went to heaven instead. <laughs> and so, um, but I do. I think yeah. I want to look into that. I think it's a great thought. Um, but what if we pitch that into the next episode? Sure. Yeah. No. That's that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go ahead and tie it, tie it off here. Um, what are your final parting words? Your last words on this earth? What are you going to be, George? Let's go. Oh, man. I love it. Hey, if you're listening and you want to reach out to us uh, and derail our podcast further, you can do so by emailing us at witsendguys at gmail.com. Witsendguys at gmail.com. Um, you can check out Brother George's YouTube channel, Council and Might. Uh, we are also playing uh our podcast or uploading them to youtube and you can put a comment there or whatever have fun but uh it's enjoyable to talk about this stuff and i hope it's a blessing to you george looking forward to uh, talking about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil next time around amen god bless you guys take care